the most meaningful art is able to be enjoyed and understood at every stage in life. With Calvin and Hobbes, you're always discovering something new. Read them when you're six and fall in love with the colorful adventures of a boy and his tiger, but revisit them when you're 16 or 26 and they take on an entirely different but equally impactful meaning. Calvin and Hobbes launched November 1985, written, drawn, colored, and lettered by this man, Bill Watterson. Watterson was only 27 years old when Calvin and Hobbes was picked up for syndication, and he had gone through several rejected projects before finally landing on the one strip that would reshape the way people looked at newspaper comics. They weren't just throwaway cartoons. He firmly believed that an artist's work shouldn't be judged by the medium for which it was created. There's no such thing as low and high art, just creations that either speak to people or don't. Part of what makes the strip so timeless is that you don't need to understand the pop culture or political context of the late 80s and early 90s in order to enjoy it. There was a focus on asking questions and exploring ideas, rather than commenting on current topics as comic strips often did. Watterson challenged readers on issues of gender inequality, religious identity, education, environmentalism, philosophy, and so much more. He didn't let those two-inch panels restrict him to cheap gags or sloppy artwork. He used it as an opportunity to get people to think outside the box, or at the very least, rethink how they thought inside it. Reading Calvin and Hobbes makes you want to be an artist, an explorer, a philosopher. A simple four-panel strip can occupy your mind for an entire day. It perfectly captures the complexities of a six-year-old's imagination, from the infinite possibilities of a cardboard box to the heroic aspirations we all had as children. As the comic evolved, Watterson rendered the world inside Calvin's mind in an increasingly hyper-realistic style, while the mundane retained a more traditional comic strip look. Calvin's fantasies are always more vivid and more real than his own reality. That contrast added a unique and visually engaging dimension to the strip. And it's the details like those that set it so far ahead of its contemporaries. Watterson was constantly pushing the artistic and conceptual limits of the form. Drawing comic strips comes with heavy constraints. Chief among them is drawing space. Early newspaper editors developed a system that would maximize the number of strips on a page. And with the dying print industry, those spaces slowly became smaller and smaller. Watterson fought with the syndicates for more artistic freedom to explore alternative panel layouts and page designs. He often even experimented with throwing out the format completely, making for some incredibly dynamic artwork. But it wasn't just Watterson's draftsmanship that made the comic so exceptional. His strips have substance. Too often with short-form storytelling, characters become dull, interchangeable props for the humor. And comic strips can be more than a three-panel build-up to a bad pun. Calvin and Hobbes both have genuine personalities, and it makes them incredibly elastic in terms of story possibilities. They share a broad imagination, an appreciation for art, and a disdain for authority, not unlike the two 16th and 17th century philosophers for which they were named, Thomas Hobbes and John Calvin. So many strips rely on the punchline, which makes their characters plastic and predictable. Garfield's a lazy cat who loves eating and being an asshole, and that's every Garfield strip. It's lazy writing in the most literal sense. And Garfield's lack of quality comes from Jim Davis barely being involved in the creative process, with ghost writers and assistant artists penciling and coloring nearly every strip since the mid-90s. Garfield has become a hollow brand for merchandise. There's no passion in that work. Calvin and Hobbes' massive cultural footprint derives solely through great artwork and storytelling, not a flood of merchandise and constant film and television adaptations. Watterson felt that turning his characters into merchandise would violate the spirit of the strip and contradict his message. He's protective of the form. Newspaper comics are a dying medium, so it's understandable that he'd want to preserve what he believed made his work unique. There's always a risk of bastardization. Having something special turned into mass-produced, uncharacteristic garbage like this. Everyone's first exposure to Calvin and Hobbes will always be these strips. If you want Calvin and Hobbes, you have to seek it out. It's not going to be shoved down your throat. And that makes the experience more intimate. It becomes personal. It becomes valuable. Art before commerce. That's how it should be. And that simply cannot exist in an industry built on spending millions of dollars. But when it's just one man, one voice, with a pencil and a sheet of paper, a truly unique perspective can be expressed. One of the best things to come out of Watterson's refusal to license his characters is the rise in artists creating their own tributes to Calvin and Hobbes. He's forced people to embrace their creativity 
and make their own art from these characters. Knitted plushies, fan animations, short films. The best thing a creator can do for his fans is inspire them to create themselves. There won't ever be any more Calvin and Hobbes. After 10 years of creating that world, Watterson has said everything he wanted with those characters. And outside of appearing in a few panels of Pearls Before Swine and this oil painting of Petey Otterloop he did for a Parkinson's charity, Watterson seems to be done with comics. But that doesn't mean it's over. I see kids today reading Calvin and Hobbes with the same enthusiasm I had as a child. Art is never done as long as it has an audience. Even in a few panels, you can develop characters and express an outlook on life as the months go by. And before you know it, readers are seriously invested in, in the world that you've created.